Hi everyone, this is Real World Audio and I'm continuing uh, analyzing uh, Jean Hiraga's uh, Altec loudspeaker, the JHMS15, uh, which was his uh, signature loudspeaker series, or not series, <laughs> signature loudspeaker that he made, that he built in uh, around uh, 2009. So this is Six Moons review from 2009 of his magnificent uh, implementation of, of this fantastic driver and uh, and as I promised this series is born as a promise to give you uh, a description of his uh, loudspeaker and, and compare it to my implementation and um, of course I'm going to talk to you now about step zero so you see he has an external crossover and he did not put the crossover components inside the cabinet. And for all of you, I recommend to do the same. If you want to upgrade your loudspeaker, move the crossover components out from your cabinet into a separate cabinet. No matter what, if you have like a bookshelf, like 20 years old bookshelf speaker, 40 years old bookshelf speaker, move it out of the cabinet and that's because the uh, capacitors are extremely sensitive to mechanical vibrations and it's going to cause you a lot of smearing uh, if there is a, a capacitor inside your cabinet being subjected to those high pressures which are inside the cabinet especially if you have a sealed box then the air pressure changes inside the cabinet are just enormous when you think about what an effect they have on a capacitor. So even if you just have a first order capacitor in a sealed cabinet, just a single cap basically, move it out, move it outside and, and you will benefit to a huge degree because of that. And it's not just because of the mechanical pressure of the sound, pressure of the airwaves inside the cabinet, but also because of the electromagnetic radiation that your loudspeakers, loudspeaker magnets and your voice coil generates. We are talking about magnetic fields of one Tesla and higher, and that has enormous effect a tremendous feedback on your crossover components. So try to move, make them uh, move away, move them away from your loudspeaker magnets and your voice coils. And then this sort of uh, crosstalk will be greatly, vastly diminished. And you will notice that a layer of fatigue a layer of haze, a layer of uh, issues, problems goes away from the sound. You have much, much better low level resolution, better imaging. Everything is just sounds more natural. So that's why I recommend for all of you guys to watch all my videos, because even though I I'm, I'm, might be just covering a specific subject, but I give advice for not just that sort of technology. Uh, you can use this information for every single loudspeaker you have, basically. Except single driver loudspeakers, because they have no crossover. But I have tons of other information that you can use for that type of thing as well. So, uh, let's see. So, for outside crossovers, uh, you see them for very little, very few companies do that. And only at uh, the most expensive price range. So for example, when you look at AudioNote, they are really big on using external crossovers. But for them, I think it starts like at a price range of uh, $20,000 plus dollars or something like that, or maybe even higher. Uh, also, when you look at Hiraga's, his, his loudspeaker also cost the same amount of money, I think like 18,000 euros in 2009. So today in US dollars also, because since then uh, this has become more of a scarcity because there were only two, I mean 10 of them, pairs of them made. 
So probably nowadays you can get uh, need to put much more than 20k to get a pair of these uh, speakers. Uh, but if you are at home and you have a little bit of urge in you, you can do this for yourself. And all you need is your time, an extra box and some extra connectors and uh, a bit of a speaker wire to hook them up to your loudspeaker and it will not break your bank. You don't have to shell out 20k to have an external crossover. Just do it. Uh, so let's see what else is there to know about the cabinet here. Uh, John Hiraga went, uh, I would say, a more modern way for this cabinet. And, uh, and in another uh, report, I think I have seen and, and I'm really 99% sure that it was this same loudspeaker, uh, this series. Uh, that on the inside he treated it against resonance. So there's heavy dampening on the inside of this cabinet. So basically this loudspeaker is more of a traditional cabinet where the cabinet is uh, behaves as a box and the front so basically that part of the air pressure that your driver creates propagates in the front that's responsible free for frequencies down to about 300 hertz because the driver is capable down to 560 hertz and the front baffle helps to it to bring it down to about 300 hertz and then the brake pressure of the cone is used by the cabinet to convert it to, uh, to lower frequencies which exit through the port and they fill up the response below 300 Hz. So that's how bass reflex cabinets work. And uh, what uh, today's uh, general trend is doing that while you have that back pressure that also creates a movement of the cabinet. So your cabinet starts to expand and contract, which by itself is not a problem because, for example, that's how your violin makes its low registers. That's how the double bass makes its sound, that the two sides of the double bass starts to resonate back and forth as the strings are uh, so the bow gives energy to the strings, the strings start to resonate the neck of the double bass and the neck gives those vibrations to the body and the body vibrates many octaves lower in frequency and, and just amplifies those low sound waves. And that's the same thing that a cabinet does. So your driver is like the strings of a double bass by itself capable only to transmit the energy at a very high frequency they yes they are capable to resonate at a very low frequency but there they are incapable to transmit the energy to the air and that's why you have a, a horn attached to them or a bass reflex cabinet or a mass loaded uh, 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 transmission line or, or a quarter wave transmission line to get those the coupling at the base frequencies much better to the air so that the energy can be transmitted to the air and and to you however during this transmission process uh, the the quality of the material of which your loudspeaker is made of becomes beyond crucial and that's why when you have a double bass, when you have a violin or a cello, uh, that's why the master cellos, the fine specimens, cost beyond an arm and a leg because the material they need to be made with to transmit pure sound is beyond rare and the talent to manufacture is, is just absolutely crazy. So you need a perfect wooden structure made of tone wood so all these fine instruments 
which amplify bays with their wooden structure. They use wood that's called tone wood and that includes the piano as well. The soundboard of the piano is made from tone wood and the best tone wood is spruce but tone wood grade spruce. I'm going to talk about that in detail later, not now, it's a huge subject by itself. But what pertains to us is that the cabinets today are not made from tone wood. They are made from something that could be the furthest away from tone wood and they are made from MDF, medium density fiber board, which is without the single shadow of the doubt, the shittiest tone material ever made. Ever tried making a violin or a double bass from MDF? Well, try to make one, try to listen to it, and uh, then you will get the idea that MDF has nothing to do about music. All MDF has to do about is uh, cost efficiency. That's the only material that loudspeaker manufacturer companies can afford to use on a large scale. And, and that's because uh, MDF can be made to be consistent and, and you just need to order a batch of uh, 10,000 sheets and then you just cut your uh, loudspeaker cabinets with a CNC machine by the tens of thousands and you are good and you can make your company floating with that technology. But if you want to step up from that and uh, build your cabinet from something better, which is... Uh, uh, plywood which has a wooden structure inside and it's not pulped and uh, compressed and, and glued together sawdust basically but it has it has a, a, a structure in it uh, it has fibers very long very dense fibers and the fibers are the one that are capable to uh, transmit the resonances uh, and, and, and as you notice that uh, loudspeaker companies in the past have started using uh, real wood to make the loudspeaker cabinets and that gives them a very musical sound. But if you use uh, uncontrolled wood and, and wood that is not of the right uh, consistency, uh, not selected properly, then you will end up with a solution where the wood does not behave in a way to propagate your bass frequencies properly, but it will start to uh, get a life of its own and it will start to uh, propagate random resonances which are defined by the size of your cabinet, by the height, the width and the depth. And that's where loudspeaker manufacturers started to use the golden ratio. Because when you use the golden ratio to formulate the size of the cabinets, the ratios of the cabinet uh, dim dimensionality, that's when the individual resonances will fall the furthest apart from each other and they will add up the least and create the least interference to the sound. And, uh, and the next step that the loudspeaker industry has made beyond this point was to add dampening to your cabinet. One first strategy of dampening was to introduce internal bracing. So let's see an example for that. Where can we see that? I think we can see... Oh, it doesn't scroll like that. Let's scroll manually. Here you go. There is an example for internal bracing. So instead of having a hollow cabinet, then you start adding those internal supports. So those internal supports will prevent your cabinet from doing random warpings, random torsions. So it's much stronger now, so your cabinet cannot warp this way, it cannot warp this way, 
and uh, you, you do not have fluctuations this way, so you will have a much clearer sound. However, you are going to lose that double bass effect. So now your uh, face plate and your back plate, they cannot just dilate and uh, come back and go with each other, work like a true double bass, because the internal support keeps them rigid. So now they are broken up. And, and instead of being able to create that single big movement that corresponds to the lowest frequency that this cabinet would be able to uh, perform, which would be the same sound frequency as a double bass is capable to put out. Because we have put these uh, uh, divisions there, it's only this much. This is the lowest frequency that your cabinet will be able to support. And then you are depending on your port to fill out the bass. And I can tell you that the port uh, does not behave the same way, uh, doesn't generate the sound the same way as, as your loudspeaker driver does, as, as your tone wood does, but how a port works, it creates a pressure wave. So instead of having a nice car wash, enjoying your shower, you are getting a pressure wash of bass. And when you are getting the pressure wash of bass, then you are getting a lot of artifacts that come with it. You are getting all of those high frequency resonances that are inside the cabinet amplified by your port's dimensions. So when you look at all kinds of port designs, you have like a 6 inch long port or maybe a 2 inch long port and the length of your port and the diameter of your port is going to define those high frequencies which are going up to the kilohertz range that are going to be amplified to a degree large enough that it's going to smear your sound. And that's why people who use sealed cabinets love the sound of their cabinets, of their speakers, because you do not have those colorations coming out. And by the way, those resonances that exit the port are of opposite phase compared to the resonances that the cone generate. So it, the two doesn't add up, they cancel each other, they work against each other. And because of the time difference, the space difference, uh, they are going to smear the heck out of each other. And that's one reason why people put the ports in the back because then uh, the smear is not that obvious and that kilohertz smear is going to just get lost on the wall refractions instead of hitting you uh, directly in the front. However, uh, let's not go into port design right now because there's much more to it. So front ports are not... Uh, do not have just disadvantages, front ports also have advantages, but, and I have talked about that in my previous videos, and I will talk about it because people tend to not watch <laughs> old content because somehow, if it's been published uh, last day or last week or last year, it somehow loses interest and actuality. It, it, it's as if every single day, uh, our technology is born anew. That's what. That's how YouTube presents it to us, and that's how viewers want it. We always want the newest videos. If it's been done a week ago, who cares? It's rubbish. It's outdated. No, guys, it's not outdated. If you are interested in audio technology, go back to my earliest videos and start watching from the beginning, because I give you an education and I start from the ground up. And if you want a well-rounded education, you start in preschool. You don't jump in in the middle of high school and then you just uh, uh, are lost. And, and you think you learned something, but uh, you did not because uh, you do not have the skills yet to put the thing together. So let's come back here and to our, uh, our, our, our road. 
And by the way, uh, here I'm showing this other example. This is also an Altec 604 driver. Uh, this is uh, Bill Billford's uh, website. And by the way, he did a really magnificent implementation of the, the 604. Uh, he's using it with a 300 B amp. And, and he is a really happy camper with it. And he has excellent advice. And... Uh, and when I'm talking about the, the cabinet internal bracing, I'm not trying to uh, tell that oh, he did something wrong. He did something which is the best, uh, what we think of with, with the current engineering uh, thinking at this level where our engineering is today at, at, at our age. And, and what makes the most sense, how you can get the most out of it when you think as a, as a loudspeaker manufacturer of our current company. But what I am doing is that with my mentor, we have reviewed every single loudspeaker manufacturing uh, technology. We have taken apart everything, break, broke them down to, to the mechanics, how they work, their physics. And, and we also took apart music instruments, broke them down to their physics. We did just as much research into how music instruments work as how loudspeakers work. And I put the two technologies together and figured out how to make loudspeakers that behave as a music instrument. And that's what I'm telling you. So here, this was one stage of development where we added the internal bracing. This started to happen already in the 70s, 80s, and since then, today, uh, what people have started to do, actually they started to do it, I think, already in the 80s, 90s, to start to make the cabinet a heavier material, thicker material. Uh, the best choice would be like thick wood, maybe a oak or teak wood or multi-layer lamination of that. But it gets beyond expensive and you cannot sp sell loudspeakers like that. And that's why manufacturers reached out to MDF. Because you can get a thick piece of MDF for very cheap. And you can manufacture it constantly and consistently. Ah, but... That creates also a major loss of efficiency and you are cutting out the contribution of the cabinet. So now the cabinet doesn't contribute to your base. You, you took out the double base from your quartet basically and you changed it for a port. And, and of course, today, all of the loudspeaker engineers will tell you that we took out the double bass from the quartet because it colors the sound. And yes, they are right. Because the way they are using the double bass, they are not using tone wood to make the sound, but they are using MDF. And you, if you ever build a double bass from MDF, it will be absolutely horrid. And the same thing goes for loudspeakers. If you build a loudspeaker from MDF and you don't brace it, it will sound horrid. So yes, all the engineers today are right, but at the same time they are wrong because that's the, not the road for audio perfection, but they are right the second time because they have no choice because for mass production, they cannot afford to use tone wood or anything that approximates tone wood. They are forced to use MDF. They are forced to use, go that way. But you, my dear subscriber, my dear viewer, you are free to build the cabinet the way you want. And if you build your cabinet from quality wood, it will not cost you significantly more than building it from MDF you will just have a, a marginal increase in the total cost of your project. So that's where we stop today because I'm going over time. So thank you for tuning in and uh, let's continue this later. Please subscribe and like. Bye-bye.